Good morning. Good morning. I'm glad you beat me to that punch. I'm going to stand up here and just move my mouth. I'm going to let Raymond. <laughs> it's great to be in the house of the Lord, is it not today? It's a nice balmy day. I understand we had some rain last night. I slept right through it. Exodus chapter 4, verse 10 through 17. Exodus chapter 4, verse 10 through 17. But Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither in the past or since you and I have spoken, uh, since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow with speech and tongue. And the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not the Lord? Now therefore go. And I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. But he said, Oh, my Lord, please send someone else. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, you will be glad in his heart, or so he will be glad in his heart, and you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. I will be your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you both what to do. And he said, and he shall speak for you to the people. And he shall be your mouth and you shall be as God to him. And take in your hand this staff by which you shall do the signs. All right. Finishing up here with uh, the chain of excuses that Moses is trying to use to get out of this ministry, to get out of this mission. And we look over them. The first one is, who am I, Lord, who am I to go? You know what I've done. You know that I'm guilty of murder. You know that they're looking to kill me. Who, who, who am I to go? And... Moses kind of somewhat kind of plays dumb. Oh, who shall I send? Send me. You know, the God talking to you, Moses. That's, that's who I'm sending you. And when that excuse doesn't work, what, what does Moses come up with? Well, the, the people, they won't listen. They won't listen. And notice at every turn, God doesn't go, man, Moses, you've got a point there. You're a nobody. I should pick somebody smarter than you. And he doesn't go, you know, I haven't told you my name before. My name is God. Now go. And he doesn't, you know, you got a good point. The people are dumb. And they like being slaves. You're right, Moses. I'll, I'll go down the road and I'll, I'll find someone else. Notice that every refrain, God looks and says, it's okay. I'll be with you. Go. No, 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 it's, it really is okay. You tell them Yahweh has sent you. Now go. And then Moses comes over the next year and goes, it's all right, Moses. And the, set, and the third time, Moses gets some cool party tricks. Take your stick, Moses, and throw it on the ground. And Moses goes, oh, man, I got to get another stick. This one's ruined. I hate it when my, st I really do hate it when my sticks in the yard, my walking sticks become snakes. They're just worthless then. Kind of spineless. That one just came to me. You could use that one whenever you want. I hate it when that happens. And I can't wear these clothes because oh, it's always dangerous when you do this and preach this message. Yeah, I can't wear my clothes because every time I put my hand in there, it, come, it comes out okay this time. But in his case, it came out white. Now I've got this ruined hand. And I can't drink out of my cup because every time I drink out of my cup, it's bloody. Moses, I give you these things as signs to show you that I'm with you. And notice Moses goes, you're right. I'll go. No. Moses comes up with one more excuse, and then the real reason is why Moses doesn't go is betrayed. But Moses said to the Lord, 
I am not eloquent. Either in the past or since we've been talking in this last chapter. I am slow of speech and of tongue. And a lot of times when people translate this as stutter, and it, 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 you can. Yeah. To literally transfer, translate, it's like I have a heavy mouth and a heavy tongue. I don't really understand exactly what that means, but apparently um, Moses may have stuttered, or he may have such a thick Boston accent that the Egyptians could understand. Because I understand from, in Boston, people can die from hat attacks. He died of a hat attack. A bunch of hats ganged up and beat him up. No, his hat attacked him. His heart, yes! I was exiled to Michigan for five years as a child. My family moved there, and everyone thought I talked funny, and yet they all seemed to talk funny back. I Apparently, there's a different way of saying the word pin, 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 and pin. Must be a Yankee thing. Moses is essentially doing this. I don't talk, God, Lord. But I'd like to tell you what you say, the way you were talking. And my mouth is heavy, and my tongue is heavy. And I would like to tell them about the good news they can, but it's the kids, it, 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 it just can't touch it. I just can't do it. It just, it, 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 my hands are right. And it, it, it just, I deal with me, and not every kid. What was that, Moses? I'm not every kid. What was that? I'm not. Eloquent, 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 yes, and I said, we love excuses. Moses has rattled off some great ones. Well, I'm a nobody. Yeah, that's kind of the point. I don't know who you are. I'm the thing in the bush that's burning, yet not consuming it, talking to you, and you're still alive. Got it. They won't listen to me. You throw a stick down, and it becomes a snake. Two things. People are either going to run, or they're going to pay attention to what you're about ready to say. I don't speak well. I'm not eloquent. Notice what God says. He's going, hey, you're right, Moses. I could barely understand when you were saying eloquent. That's right. I'll go down and get someone else. Thank you. Notice that's not what God says. God's response to every excuse is always, you're going. And I will be with you. Who, Moses, makes man's mouth? You do. Who makes his tongue? Do. Who makes him mute? You do. Who makes a blind man see? You do. Who makes a man deaf? You do. If I've called you to talk to Pharaoh to be my mouthpiece for me, do you think you're going to show up to Pharaoh and send the death? I make you mute, I make you speak. I make you see, I make you blind. I make you deaf, I make you hear. Why would I send you to do a task that I have not equipped you to do? Notice at every excuse, Moses is equipped. The first time, go, well, who am I? Don't just worry, you don't about it, go. I will be with you. I will go with you to Pharaoh. The last one, here are some cool tricks to pull. And they're not tricks, they're miracles designed to show the power of the Lord. And yet Moses still comes up with this bogus excuse. I don't talk well. And what happens is when Moses is actually making these statements, Moses is actually countermanding two things about God. One, that God's call upon his life is real. And two, that he will actually do exactly as, his sa as he says and be with Moses. Moses, I can put a tongue in your mouth and I can take it out. 
I can make you hear, and I can make you deaf. I can make you see, and I can make you blind. Well, I don't think you can. That's really what Moses is saying. And that's really what we are saying when God calls us into doing things, and we go, I don't know, I'm a nobody. I can't talk well. You all have seen me read the scriptures, and sometimes they can get kind of interesting. I have dyslexia, so words on the page move around, and I do the best I can. And I use that for a little while as an excuse, because when the Lord called me into ministry, well, I'll back up a little bit further. While I was in high school, I had the school counselor, the principal, and my teachers come and sit down with me, and they said, Ashley, you need to, you're a smart fella, but you probably need to stay away from jobs that require a lot of high-level mathematics and a lot of reading. Well, you know, they were hard for me. And interesting enough, the Lord made me a machinist, which requires a lot of high-level mathematics. And then he called me to be a minister to go to seminary. And if you don't think there's a lot of reading involved in seminary, every professor believes that his class is the only class you have. Because they assign three books of reading. And not, not like three books, three books of reading. And then when you complain about it, I go, you have other classes? No! You're the only one. <laughs> and so I had to do all this reading. And you look at it and you go, but Lord, I'm not a, I'm not a good reader. I don't even read, I don't even read scripture sometimes exactly accurate because the word moves around on the page. And notice, he didn't go, okay, you get a pass. Because if it is, I wouldn't be here, I'd still be a machinist, Right? See, we come up with a lot of excuses, and we forget who made us. And the God who made you and the God who set you upon this earth is the exact same God who will equip you for the task. Because if you were shot out of the womb, fully able to execute every mission from God, there's not a lot of miracle or grace within it. And folks, seriously, it's a miracle that I communicate properly, goodly with you. Wouldn't know if I'd actually amen that one. Thanks there, Brother Steve. Appreciate it. I'm going to go home and call my mom. <laughs> She'd say the same thing. And yet, this is what Moses is doing. But at the end of the day, the Lord looks at Moses and says, you're going. And notice now the real reason raises its head, and it's the same reason we have. Oh, my Lord. Please send someone else. When we are making excuses for God's calling in our life, whether it is into full-time ministry or whether it is into being a minister within the church or being able to work within the church or being the best minister in your place of work and witness in your place of work, we begin with all kinds of excuses that we think are kind of cool. Lord, I don't want to lose that relationship to where later on I can eventually witness to them when I develop enough courage to actually say something about you. So I don't want to ruin it now. I want to be that guy. Or when are you going to say something? I've got a plan. It involves the word never. But this is what I want you to do. See, what happens is we begin to make excuses, and we rationalize away the reasons as to why. And, 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 we, and we start looking at it, and we go, but you don't want me? I'll talk well. That's Okay. And we've gotten slick, too. What happens is we know that these excuses are bad. So what we do is we come up with some really cool ones. And, 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 and it's almost, what I like about it is, we end up blaming God for the reason as to why we don't need to do the ministry. Or do what he's called us to. We look at one and we go, well, I've had... Now, it's an actual conversation, not for somebody in this church, but I've been in ministry for a good long while, and this is an actual conversation I've had. God keeps putting this in my path. And deep down, in my, I feel in my heart that this isn't where God is calling me, but he keeps putting it in my path. What, what do you think? 
This morning I got up and felt like eating oatmeal. Tomorrow I'll feel like having eggs. But I might change my mind and feel like having toast. Do you think God is trying to tell me something? Yes. Is he putting it in your path? Yes. Probably he wants you to execute. But, but I don't feel called to it. Well, do you have any other basis for not executing on this? Well, no. Have you prayed about it? Well, no. Have you read scripture about it? Well, no. Then how do you base your feelings upon it? Well, I don't feel like... Moses doesn't feel like doing this. Hence the five excuses. If you base your decisions upon only your feelings, you will make some really bad decisions. Right? There are many times I have felt like punching the folks in the lane in front of me. So I was coming home on 317, the person doing 50. And a 75. If you pull over, the evil side of me wants to get out and slap you till you know how to drive. The good side is like, oh, calm down, man. Calm down. Calm down. You calm down. Blood pressure. Blood pressure. Blood. <laughs> Feeling something is a great way of saying I'm not doing it. Moses doesn't feel like doing this. Look at the excuses Moses gives. Who am I? Who are you? They're not going to listen. I don't talk well. Send someone else. Begin looking at the ministry that is being placed in front of you. And if God keeps putting it in your path, your feelings on the matter may not be valid. But yet, so notice how we explain it away. I, I don't feel God calling me to this. And I don't want to work in a ministry where I don't feel God's calling. But he keeps putting it in my path. Hmm. Perhaps maybe you should put your feelings aside and ask the Lord what he wants. I didn't feel like being a minister. I know that as a pew sitter when I was in church, that I used to pick apart his sermons. And I know there are people here today going, click, no, click, no, no. I got that, Miss Van. I got that. And that's part and parcel. When I was in seminary, oh man, you want to see a room of sharks taken for, with fresh meat? Have a preacher preach in front of a room full of preachers. Whoo, man. I know. I didn't feel like doing those things. And then we've got the others like going, well, <sighs> the call needs to be so crystal clear that, that I, just don't, I just want to be sure I'm called. Did God give Moses some signs? He's talking to him from a burning bush that's not yet consumed. His staff turns into a snake, his hand turns leprous, and his water can turn to blood. I think those are pretty clear signs. Other than the audible fact that the Lord keeps talking to him and refuting his arguments. Well, Lord, I, I understand that this is an important ministry, but, you know, I'm not 100% sold out for it. And I believe that a person, or I feel that a person should be 100% sold out for a ministry before they go and do it. Really, have you read the story of Gideon making excuses from inside a wine press, telling the Lord that he is a nobody? Or perhaps the story of Jonah, who says, yeah, I'll get right on that Nineveh thing. First ticket to Tarsus, please. He didn't feel like going either, did he go? Yeah, he went and kind of stunk after he did. See, when we base our decisions upon feeling like it, we can dismiss anything away. I feel like paying taxes. But logically, I know that if I do not pay them, eventually I'm going to get some cool bracelets. And they'll take my stuff. But I don't feel like paying it. And then we've also learned a new excuse, and it's, it's, well, if every fiber of my being isn't resonating with a yes, then it's clearly not the Lord. 
Moses is being called to do a thing at the age of 80, and not every fiber of his being is resonating with a yes, as indicative of the five excuses he gives giving to the Almighty. See, we've learned to shift the excuse, and it sounds good, and it's still as corrupt as what Moses is doing. Does God put this ministry in your path? Yes. Then execute. He will let you know very quickly. You will find out. I don't feel like it. Notice what it says here. Notice what the text says. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said. When we look at this in, in, in sections where God gets angry in the Bible, what, what we do is we start to apply human emotion to God, and when we hear the word angry, we get, What is your stinking problem, Moses? What is your major malfunction? I have given you a bunch of signs. I want you to move out. Because that's what we understand by anger. Oh, and I've had many a one-way conversation that way, both on the giving and receiving in. My last sergeant major I worked with was a great guy. He could get angry, and you would know it. And he wouldn't say a word. And I was more afraid of him than anybody else that yelled. He could let you know how angry he was with you instantaneously and not raise his voice. And we asked him, he said, Sergeant Major, why, you know, we know you're angry. Why don't you yell? And he says, I'm Sergeant Major of the United States Army. If I've got to yell, it means I've lost my composure. I have the authority to do what I'm about ready to do, and I have the power to do what I'm about ready to do, and I don't have to yell to make it happen. I just have to let you know how displeased I am with your behavior. I watched him in a command and staff one time look at a company commander who had said something that everybody in the room went, I was looking for my body armor and left it in the office. And after everybody had kind of shot him apart, the sergeant major just kind of looked at him. And he went, Well, sir, if you do that, you have all these problems ahead of you, and you and I are going to have a conversation in my office that you're not going to like. Do we understand? And then he went back to his work. And he understood. God's anger here is not God yelling at Moses, but Moses is very aware that he has angered a holy God. See, what happens when we make excuses for executing God's command, God doesn't go away. God doesn't give us a pass. God doesn't look and go, man, I tried to get Moses on team God, but Moses won't play. Maybe if I yell at Moses. Moses is going to execute God's call. Moses is going to execute it the way God is telling him to. God is going to add another person into the mix to help Moses out. But Moses is going. And in God's anger, not a yelling, fitful rage issue, he is going to address Moses and how it is going to be. But Moses, you're going. I was in a meeting one time with the division chaplain. He's kind of a nice guy. His name's Tommy Preston. Great guy. There's an argument at the end of the table between two chaplains back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I was wondering when he was going to step in. And he was getting angry at the conversation. I was expecting him to start yelling. And then he just looks at me and he goes, Ashley, how's Stephanie? Do you want to? No, no, no. How's your wife? And I had just joined the Army, and we were really new. And we hadn't had a long conversation. And when everybody was done making excuses and arguments at the end of the table, he goes, okay, this is how it's going to be. You're going to do this, you're going to do this, and you're going to execute, or you can all go. You understand? And everybody did it. God in his anger looks at Moses and says, I have had enough of these excuses. 
you're going. And your brother Aaron is already on his way to meet you. And he will be your mouthpiece. I, notice what the text says. Let's take a look at it here. Let's read it to be exact. Is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? Yes, he's a priest. Thank you for noticing. Good. I know that he speaks goodly. So he'll speak for you. This is the tongue. Behold, he is coming to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You will speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you both what to say. Are you done making excuses? Here's someone that's going to go with you. You'll speak, he'll speak, I'll speak to you, you guys will execute. Are we done here? Um... Not yet. He shall speak for you to the people. He shall be your mouth. Now here's a verse that's about ready for folks to, when they grab a hold of this verse, man, they pervert this verse so bad. And you shall be as God to him. God is not transferring to Moses all the power of deity in his totality, making Moses God. That is not what is occurring here. When a man speaks for God, he is God's prophet. And God talks to the prophet, and the prophet talks to the people. And what God is saying to Moses is, I am going to communicate to you as a prophet. And you will be a prophet to Aaron, who will be a prophet by proxy for me through you. He is not saying, Moses, you are deity. And Aaron must worship you. Notice how that fixes the problem. I don't talk well. I don't want to go. I'm scared to go by myself. And really, and that's essentially what's boiling down to. I really don't want to go because I don't want to speak truth to power. To so use these excuses. Thinking that God will go away. We use these excuses thinking that, that if, I, if I don't feel it, it doesn't count. Moses isn't feeling it. Moses still goes. A lot of times we use excuses nowadays, like the ones I've mentioned, or we use the age of, I'm too young. I'm too old. Moses is 80 years old in this passage. Moses is going to do a whole lot of standing as an 80-year-old man. There are some folks that believe that if they work really, really, really hard from the time they're 20 to about the time they're 40 or 50 or 60, that they can stop, retire, and God's going to be happy with that. And God is happy that you've acquired wealth to be comfortable. But that doesn't mean that once you hit a certain age, you get to opt out of the kingdom program. Now, we have a lot of good examples within this church of people who are older and a lot of times could say, I've been here long enough, I can sit and be a pew potato and not do anything, and yet we have shining examples of that throughout this congregation. Examples to young people who think that the end goal is to retire and do nothing. And they take their time and do a great amount of work here. We see this in our Awana program. We see this in our Upward program. We see this over and over and over. But there's still that mindset among some. There's still that mindset among some of the young. Other people are doing things for me, therefore I don't have to do. There is no such thing as a calling to be a pew potato. Find it in there, and we'll put it down on the callings list. There is no such thing to be a pew sitter, to be a nobody within the church. We are all called to be active. Now, we are not all called to do the same ministries. As I said last week, we have really too many ministers, and some of them actually get churches, and they should be selling cars. But we have a lot of ministries within the church, and you have a lot of ministries around your home. See, because not only are you called to be a worker within the church, but you're also called to minister to your own families. But sometimes that TV gets in the way 
Sometimes games get in the way. I'm a gamer, folks. I'm a gameaholic and a bookaholic. I'm on the road to recovery. I am not. I'm on the way to getting stopped. Life, we say, get in the way. Have you ever noticed that if it's important to you, you will do it? You ever notice that? Is being a good minister in your home important to your family and to you? If it is, you do it. If it isn't, you don't. What about in your workforce? Why well, don't want to lose friends? You're going to lose friends. Or you're going to adapt yourself so much like the world that your friends cannot determine to distinguish you from the world. Is that the godly example you wish to set? See, it's not simply that God calls people only to be ministers and that subsect only and therefore you're free of your calling and, and, because I wasn't smart enough to come up with a cool enough excuse. God calls us all. There isn't a person in this room that does not have a calling God wants you to do. He may not have laid it on your heart yet. But there is a calling for each and every one of you, and it isn't to occupy space on a cloth bench. It is to be active. And we have a great deal of number of folks here that are very active in God's call, but we also have some folks that sit on pews. And justify it with, well, not me. Who are you? They won't listen to me. I did test the send someone else. I don't feel called. I'm not a hundred percent sold out. It doesn't resonate with every fiber of my body. All those excuses are found there in that text. And God's response to every single one of them is, yeah, that's cute. You're still going. Yeah, that's cute. I'll give you Aaron and he can talk for you. Take the staff with you that you're going to execute my orders with. See, it's nice to come to church. It's nice to hear good sermons. It's nice to be seen. If that's the again goal of church, then there's nothing special about us. There's nothing reproducing about us. The end goal of why we come to church is to be trained and equipped to be able to go into the world and take salt and light into a community that is hurting and dying. And if you have not seen the absolute wretchedness and depravity of our culture, then simply turn on Fox News and watch the coverage of the five police officers that were shot by an individual who thought he was going to kill people just because of their skin color. That is wretchedness and depravity. Watch what happens in the Middle East when people decide other people are of low value and burn them alive. That is wretchedness and depravity. Turn on the local news where you have story after story after story of violent crime, violent assault, assault against children. And that is wretchedness and depravity. And that doesn't fix itself unless we take a message of reconciliation, hope, and Jesus Christ to people whose only hope in life is whether or not they'll survive the day. And we justify not doing it with the statement of, I'm not called. You're lying to yourself. Because you are. Then you can try to run from it and escape from it. But you're lying to yourself. You're here today. You've been wrestling with some type of calling upon your life that God has for you. Whether it's into vocational ministry, whether it's not. Whether it's just simply to be a better father, a better mother, a better child. A better follower after the things of God. This praise band comes and sings. I want you to sit and as 
you are singing those words, I want you to contemplate whether or not there is a calling of God upon your life. Because, dear Christian, none of you in this room escaped the calling of God. There is something God calls you to do. Big, small, little, great. If you're here today and you'd like to know more about salvation that is found only through Jesus Christ, I have my microphone turned off. We can sit and talk about the graciousness of our Lord and Savior and the salvation that he has for us. As the praise band comes to sing, if you will please stand with us.